Welcome to Turn a Page, the official comic book club for Nerd Initiative. Each week, the NI Bullpen will be covering the world of comics, talking to creators, deep diving into some fantastic stories, and much more. Now let's hand it over to the team and turn a page. Welcome to a very special edition of Turn a Page, the Nerd Initiative Comic Book Club on YouTube. I am your host, Ken M. You know me as the host of the OTPH podcast, but I'm also Nerd Initiative's Comics Editor-in-Chief. To my right, your left, I let him do this intro because I cannot do it justice. Coming at you live and direct, straight from a folding chair in the ODPH studio. My name's Off the Cuff Tom, your pop culture connoisseur. Thank you so much, Ken, and thank you so much, Nerd Initiative. It's always a pleasure being here. Absolutely, and like we said, this is a special edition because... Comic fans all around the world got some news that we have all been waiting to hear at this year's San Diego Comic-Con. It caught like an inferno. You would so, very well played <laughs> because at the Massive Verse panel, which we scream on the ODPH, we scream on Nerd Initiative, and we back it up each and every time with the quality of books that are on this line. Comic's most exciting line, kicking off a new series, is a must-watch event. It's a must-have book each and every time out. And we were finally blessed with the knowledge that a certain sequel book, book two, of one of the pillars of the Massiverse has finally been greenlit for Kickstarter. So as you are seeing this episode, the QR code will be popping up throughout the show. You want to make sure you're clicking on that and signing up for this book because you don't want to be missing this in any which way, shape, or form. I can go on and on about this book. But we have a friend of the show that is back on here that can talk about this very, very much better than I can. You know his work from Self Made by Image Comics. You know him from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers run on Boom Studios. And you know him from Ultraman at Marvel. But you also know him as the co-creator of Inferno Girl Red for Image Comics and Black Market Narrative. Please welcome to the show the one and only Matt Groom. Matt, what is going on? Hello again, guys. Every time I get an intro like that, I'm just kind of like bowled over and I don't really know how to respond. It's, you're, you're such professionals. Um, it's great to be here. I'm very excited to be back. Very excited to be finally be able to confirm you to go read book two and talk about it a bit. So yeah, thanks for having me back. Oh, thank you for coming back on. Yeah, this has been one news event that we have been eagerly anticipating because obviously after the success of book one, which you can get right now in trade paperback form, at your favorite comic shop, so you definitely want to make sure you're going to get that. If you don't have it already, I have about three copies, so I mean, I'm good my way, but you should too. <laughs> With the news that the sequel is coming out, if anybody hasn't checked this series out, Matt, why don't we give a quick once-over about what is Inferno Girl Red all about? Yeah, so Inferno Girl Red is the story of a teenage girl named Cassie Costa. She gets an invitation to a prestigious school in a very cool city called apex city and this is a bit of a change for her because thus far in her life she's been bouncing from city to city with her mom as her mom struggles to find work they haven't had the most privileged life but this is the chance for a fresh start and the opportunity to sort of change her destiny but uh shortly after she arrives the whole city is ripped out of our dimension and then cast into darkness into another dimension and she gets the chance to do something about it when a magical bracelet rockets into her life and gives her the ability to turn into Inferno Girl Red. But the bracelet is powered by belief, and that's not something that she's really uh, cultivated in her life for very understandable reasons. So she needs to find a way to find belief in this impossible situation, find new allies, and overcome all of these challenges. And that, that was the world we introduced in Inferno Girl Red Book 1. Yeah, and it is such an incredible debut. I mean, with you, Erica Dorso, Igor Monti, and Becca Carey doing the the amazing job about bringing the whole world of Apex City to life and really driving home the point of how Cassia is a symbol of hope. And especially in this day and age with comic characters, to be a symbol of hope in this manner, it's really rare and it's hard to find. But yet throughout her journey, getting these powers and having these insurmountable odds against her, trying to find the way to save the day, and especially she's not fully confident in herself, and the relationship she has with her mother has been her defining strength, and with events that happen in book one, it's taken away, but she still has to find that inner strength. And when, when you're writing this, did you sit there and go, 
I really want to drive home the point of how much hope matters in this world. Yeah, absolutely. And that that was one of the the big sort of foundational pillars that we were creating the book. I think because of the nature of the world now, and, and as you're alluding to, sort of the nature of a lot of stories out there, because um, we think hope is so important, but also we wanted to make sure that it was a a nuanced and level-headed conversation about hope and belief and optimism, that it wasn't just an empty sort of like, oh, just always believe and everything will, will work out all right, because there's dangers to believing against uh, rational evidence too much. Like there's a lot of dark paths you can walk down that we've discovered in the world at the moment. Uh, and there's, it's also true that sometimes just believing isn't enough to get you through. So it's about how do you find hope and let that power you through, but also not get lost in all of the many sort of like traps that could lay down that path as well. Mm -hmm. Because there is so many obstacles in her way. I mean, first and foremost, she's going to a new school. She's meeting all these new people that she's really trying to fit in with. She lucks out and gets the roommate of the year in Harriet. Best guy <laughs> in the chair ever. Yeah. And how much of a support system she provides her. I mean, can you kind of describe their dynamic together? Yeah, I mean, I think it was very important for me to make this a team book, even if it isn't necessarily on its face a team book. Um, I think because it, it's a book about, like, the nature of humanity and what we need to do to succeed when things are at their worst, I think that we're all part of systems. We have our, like, systems of love and systems of support. And, of course, there's challenges to be overcome there as well but with harriet in particular she was a character who i think really helped cassia model some behaviors that uh helped her develop into the hero that she's going to become and then as we start taking away some other support systems as you alluded to it we're going to see like how much could harriet help how much may harriet even sort of influence cassia in the wrong direction uh and all of these interpersonal relationships and how they shape Cassia and how they shape the world are going to be the driving force of the book as we go. And yeah, we'll take some away. We'll change some, we'll challenge some. And that's, yeah, that's how we make, make the story uh, evolve over time and make sure it doesn't just start, you know, keep playing out the same old don'ts. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that it always seems like it's just such, it has just such this vibrant energy. And I think it's a lot to Erica's artwork in this too. There's so many different influences going in with this. Like when you were coming up with the creative process for Inferno Girl Red, like where was kind of your inspiration for this? It started out very early on when I saw like a Facebook post uh, in, in my, like the group for my local comic book store, like the Facebook group. And it was, um someone asking the group like hey my niece oh i think it's niece something like that has just seen a marvel film and really liked it wants to get into comics she's like in her mid-teens what's a good place to start and i was really racking my brain trying to find recommendations and i thought back to ultimate spider-man because that's kind of like i had read a few comics before that but that's what really drew me in i have all of it back there um and I went back and, and read it before I made the recommendation. And I still love it. I think it holds up for me. But it's also like 20 years old now, over 20 years old. And it feels that a little bit. It doesn't necessarily reflect the teenage experience of today. Uh, and I felt like there should be a very accessible superhero comic where you just start a book one and you keep going. There's no like confusing crossovers or tie-ins or reboots. Uh, that people can have as an access point to the world of superheroes. So he wanted to sort of create something that maybe felt a bit like Ultimate Spider-Man, um, but with a bunch of other influences infused into it to make it feel uh, modern and new. So a lot of Ultimate Spider-Man, a lot of Tokusatsu, uh, as I'm sure I've talked about before, a lot of Kamen Rider, and that sort of like the, the ability to express absurd creative things but have it have a very... Uh, real emotive sort of meaningful core. A lot of that comes from Tokusatsu as well. Hmm. Tom? Most definitely. I mean, the best part about it is that, you know, obviously everybody knows here how much of your stuff I've read, you know, read from your other works, but to see it played out in a new and modern 
tone and the the joy you do have in it and the joy you get out of your characters is a really nice play on it. And you're absolutely right. You're you're only as strong as the people that you have surrounded around you. And it's not my little pony friendship is hope and love and everything. There are <laughs> serious consequences that come along with it. Mm-hmm. And that's what is so nice. It, it, you know, it's relatable in the story that, okay, we're here. Oh, shit, we're here. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think as we get into book two, we'll start to see a lot more of that come through. Like in book one, Cassia kind of did everything that she was supposed to do and achieved incredible things and sort of like leveled up in in a bunch of different ways. But that had consequences and the consequences of everything that happened in book one are going to ripple out into book two. And Cassia's going to have to deal with even when you do everything you can and things go as right as they possibly can, you still make mistakes. And how do you keep going knowing that a lot of the time you're going to hurt as you're trying to help? Well, I've said it how many times before the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Mm -hmm. And before we get diving into a little more questions, I, we have a member of our nerd initiative bullpen, Marty Stoke, who couldn't make it here today, but he has a very special guest that wants to ask you a couple questions, Matt. So let's pop that video in and let them ask those questions. What's going on guys? It's Marty from nerd initiative. Really wish I could have been there to interview Matt groom with you, but unfortunately we had prior commitments. I'm really looking forward to the second book. And we're really looking forward to promoting the second book, just like we did for the first one. And I have here a very special guest who did a ton of promotions on her own. She is this little eight-year-old girl, little firecracker, that got these books into two of our local libraries and has been talking about it nonstop. I had to get her on here to ask a couple of questions to Matt. So without further ado, my daughter Hallie, here we go. Hi, Matt. What inspired you to make the book? And I want to know, will Holdball be in more of the books? Thanks, Ken, for letting Hallie hop on here and ask a couple of questions and hope you guys have a great interview. Well, that was so sweet. I'm done. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) I um, I, I've talked a little bit to Marty uh, sort of offline about everything that he and Hallie have done to spread the the love of the book. And it, yeah, it makes me a little emotional. I love that it, it's um, getting out into libraries and um, girls like Hallie are responding to the books. That's awesome. Uh, inspirations. We talked a little bit about um, sort of Ultimate Spider-Man and Tokusatsu already. And a lot of it really is just like having something fantastic and compelling and hopefully helpful for younger readers like Hallie and, and and older so uh hopefully that comes through and that's part of what she's responding to as for whole ball i hope so given how much work i put into figuring out the rules of whole ball and the world of whole ball um i have a lot of fondness for it so i'm probably gonna find more ways to work it in um even if it doesn't necessarily have an organic place in the story, I'll I'll force it in because I do have a lot of love for it. So hang in there. What I, we're going to find through a whole ball. What I really enjoy about not only what you do, but everybody in the Massiverse is that you really do have a whole encompassing world. You're, you're not just building the, here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, here's the location. You know, you, you've got hold ball um, over in... Dead Lucky, you know, she's got the the restaurant. I know that there's, you know, the QR codes and, and the little recipes we've talked about before. Like, yeah. you guys try and make it its own whole mass media, massive verse. Absolutely. I think a lot of it, too, is just because it's creator-owned, like, we love it so much. We pour so much of ourselves into it. And we often put uh, a lot more work into it than is strictly required on the page, but what that means is that we have all of these different ideas and different concepts that can then filter out into other things. And I think Kyle led the way with a lot of that with just like, let's do a short animated film, like with no one, let's do a, a accompanying podcast, trying to build books that are so stuffed with ideas and, and world building that starts to filter out into other ways. And then it's up to us to find other ways to um, like, find life for those other ideas. So I'm definitely going to try and live up to all of that. 
Now, out of that, how does that make you feel as a creator being able to put all those other resources out there? Do you get feel as if you get the burnout from them or do you feel as if there's, oh, I got this idea, I got that idea, I got, you know, so on and so forth, or is like your pin board at home just like a murder board instead? <laughs> <laughs> I, it definitely doesn't feel bad other than the fact that yeah. it's a lot of responsibility. Like I, I feel that heavily. And that's something that I felt since doing self-made my first image book was that total creative freedom. Um, actually, like I had a bit of a, like a aha moment with it when I was working on self-made and we had one cover that Eduardo drew. It was kind of like a, a mind trippy um, visual experience, but it was like perfectly visual, visually symmetrical down the middle. And I was like, oh, what we could do is have the self-made logo on one side and then sort of mirror it back reversed on the other side of the page. And we tried it out and it looked terrible. So we didn't do it, but that made me go like, Oh, we could have just done that. And no one would have said anything because we're in control and we can make all of the creative decisions. And I was kind of like rocked by the, the, the responsibility and the freedom of that. And that made me realize like, we need to push this, as far as it can go every single time in every single way. And that was another one of the things that sort of got me to Infodogo Red and I think sort of inspired a lot of the massive stuff was realizing like it's a massive privilege, no pun intended, to uh, <laughs> uh -huh. work, work with Image and have this total freedom and we need to make sure that we're doing the coolest stuff possible and stuff that really pushes the medium forward. I mean, I think you guys definitely are. I mean, you see the reaction with Marty and his daughter. I mean, that's just a prime example about how you have a character like Cassia who's now inspiring and, and really resonating that, that kind of message of hope. And then you see when they're now pushing, getting Inferno Go Red in libraries and just how the effect of your creations are going. I mean, that just has to be one of the biggest cosigns that you guys are doing everything right over there. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the stuff that like... I really <laughs> have to like tamp down my emotions and not like get too overwhelmed by all of that because knowing that people care enough to do that sort of thing, that not only do they feel like this story resonates with them, but they are so passionate that they want to make sure that other people can experience it. I, I don't know what bigger um, compliment we could possibly receive and get on the Kickstarter, get on the Kickstarter. And that's the thing, like, we've had that since the start, like, the with the first Kickstarter, like, immediately after we announced we were getting fan art, we were, like, having people, like, write these, like, yeah, effusive comments about how excited they were about the book and the characters. Uh, so even, you know, when things are difficult and challenging, that's the stuff that gets me through. It's knowing that people feel that passionately about the book. Well, I mean, it's created a buzz ever since it was announced. I mean, you think about with the Massiverse getting kicked off with what, you know, Kyle and Marcelo and and obviously Michael Basudel, you know, overseeing everything and building this in that when Radiant Black was taking off and really carving its niche as the premier superhero in this modern time. And then when Supermassive drops in February of 2022, that everybody who signed up for the Kickstarter knew what was coming, but for everybody mm. that didn't, really got an eye opening to what this universe is all capable of with the crossover yeah. with, you know, Marcus rogue son. We have to clarify that. Obviously, if you read rogue son, <laughs> you know what I'm, what I'm referring to and with yeah. Cassia and then, you know, with, with radiant black and seeing everybody team up together, it just took the fandom to a whole nother level. So when you're having all these books come out that we had the road, uh, dead lucky come out and rogue son come out. And then everybody was so eagerly anticipating this coming via image I mean, the anticipation, just sitting back and watching and seeing the reactions, I mean, how does that go through, like, before the first issue drops? It uh, It's difficult to describe how validating it is. I think because this book in particular has been such a long road to, to bring it to life. Like, we were, well, I, I was working on this alongside the earliest stages of Radiant Black. Like, they sort of started gestating at about the same time but just because of how long it took to find the right artist and then figure out our model and then find the way to get it to market. 
it just it took so long and there was definitely some times along the way where i was like this isn't gonna work out like this is all falling apart um but you know we just stuck to our guns and um because in a lot of ways this is a format that isn't very common at all like we're doing these Mm -hmm. double-sized issues in these small sets of releases and the reason we had to go to Kickstarter is because there's no real established way to fund something like that. And there's no test case we could point to to be like, look at this thing. This shows that there's going to be success in doing it this way. Um, so it was all very experimental. And it was only that passion and excitement that carried us through. So when people started responding, it was a great relief. And it was extremely validating. It was like, yeah, I knew there was something here. Like, I believed in it. I believed in the story. And I'm so glad that other people see it too. So do we call this now the Inferno precedent? Ooh. I, look, like, if you can get that to catch on, I would love that. Just saying. I know. Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag Inferno precedent. I know Jeremy, who's producing the show, make a note of that. We need to make that happen over on Nerd Initiative social media. But with that momentum, too, coming into this year's supermassive crossover, I mean, the fan base has already been really excited, and obviously the issues have all come out. So if anybody wasn't familiar with what Kasi was doing, they were definitely excited to see the crossover happen. Albeit, though, a little bit of a switch happened, and we did get an Inferno uh, Girl Red in there, but it wasn't the one everybody was expecting, though. Going yeah. in with that was the decision to keep Kasia out of there one that you were just saying like, oh man, I, I want to sneak it in some way, but I can't. Or how do you describe that creative process? It was a few different things coming together. One of them was that because of the delays in developing Fernal Go Red, the rest of the universe and sort of the timeline was getting ahead of Cassie's story a lot to the point where the first Supermassive actually takes place, you know, a decent way into Cassie's journey. And we didn't want to extend that too much where there was this big gap in what was happening in Supermassive versus what was happening in the in Cassia's book herself. So we didn't want to have Cassia in there for that reason. Uh, and we also wanted to communicate to people that with the Supermassives, you can't predict what's going to happen in them and you can't even predict who's mm-hmm. going to be in them. So we told people like, oh, Cassia's not going to be in this one. You can't expect to see every superhero every time. Uh, but we also... Uh, starting with the sort of the massive like fold out that we did in the first Supermassive, trying to train people to expect huge surprises. And that was one of the surprises we're able to build in. But it was only possible because of what we're talking about earlier with this desire we all have to build worlds that are so big they can't even be contained in our core books. I have this mythology for Inferno Girl Red established, you know, in our head and for us. And I was able to be like, well, I have this thing that I can now take and put into a supermassive. Um, and that's the sort of thing we want to keep doing going forward is all the extra stuff that I sort of built in to make the world feel rich and full, find places for it to appear uh, with the caveat that we never want to make it so that you have to read or experience anything else to uh, enjoy the core books. It's always read book one, read book two, read book three. If you don't read anything else, if you don't see or experience anything else, you'll still have a complete and full story, but there will be extra things as we go to make the the world feel more alive. Yeah. I mean, just to think about the, you know, the surprise twist that happens in Supermassive 2023 <laughs> out, of, out of the opening gate. I mean, Tom, or yeah, Tom, I'll let you handle this one. Wait, are we talking about the, the one in the beginning or no, the, the one beginning. at the end? The one in the beginning. Okay. Cause I mean, the, the, I, I like the one at the end, but well, yeah, to know that it's a completely, <laughs> that it's the ancient or, you know, olden timey, you know, Inferno Girl, and there's all this massive backstory, the pun absolutely intended, mm-hmm. and <laughs> it, how it's playing into the other stories, Just it, it just makes it so worth it, and unapproachable. And it's also a smart little idea on your guys to trickle in this little thing to say, oh, wait, who's that Inferno chick? I'm going to go get the other ones now and figure this out. Wait, wait, and then you read that and you go, wait, where's the gap in the middle? Now I got to get on a Kickstarter and have to figure out, you know, what's going on in the middle. Yes, shameless plug. Yes, but it, it works because, I mean, the Inferno Girl Red influence is there right from the beginning when Rogue oh, Sun yeah. is defeated. And then... Smackdown. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. But then, obviously, no, later on words. in the book... No, yeah, I know. I know. We're going to get a very <laughs> angry email from somebody after this airs. Trust me. Uh, but but we're also welcome to talk to Rogue Sun at any point on this show, too. So we're, we're always interested yeah. for that. But 
with Inferno Go Red, though, still being a part of the massive verse and the, the biggest crossover of their year thus far. I mean, to say how the fans were excited and then immediately after that issue dropped, I have to say from personal experience, I don't think I've ever received more DMs going, okay, when's book two coming of Inferno Go Red? And I go, I don't know. I know as much as you do. I'm putting the karma out in the world. And then I think it's just built up that when we heard about the panel getting announced at San Diego Comic-Con this year and when Kyle and Michael and everybody had been saying for a while, like, you don't want to miss this panel when it comes out, there was so much news involving the Massiverse that the fan base just lit up. But I know the minute this dropped, I think every single social media outlet I was on exploded with just excitement. I know the Discord went completely crazy about this. So sitting back and now with the final announcement being public that we are getting Inferno Girl Red book two, how does that feel, you know, that that weight is now off your shoulders that you can finally talk about it? It certainly feels good to be able to talk about it. Um, It's definitely like in some ways like getting back into the trenches, like, okay, now we've, we've got to like get this thing off the ground this time because I don't take any of this for granted, you know, like we've announced a, a Kickstarter for book two if the Kickstarter is funded, there will be a book too. If it's not, there's not. And I'm feeling very uh, optimistic about it. But um, it's always like you have to go out there, you have to hustle, you have to ask people to inv- invest, and you have to give them reason to invest. And I never want to like coast because this could all disappear at any moment, you know. Uh, but it feels it feels really good, and I think like a lot of that excitement comes from something that. In the massive verse, we talk a little bit about they really believe in, which is we always want to make people feel excited and curious to seek things out, never like they are obligated to. So in a super massive, we never want to go like, oh, to understand this, you have to go and read this book. That's work. But if you read mm-hmm. something, and you're like, well, that's cool. I want to know more about that. That's the feeling we're going for. We feel like that's going to inspire people to seek the books out. So the fact that 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 helped and that worked is again quite validating and this goes to show like you can run publishing that way you know it doesn't have to be cynical it doesn't have to be churn and burn you could have that goodwill building and people will back you and support you um so that's kind of the energy you want to carry into all of this and hopefully into the kickstarter absolutely and i think one aspect too is going into the kickstarter campaign this time around is there anything that you thought I really want to do different. I want to try something new or was it kind of like, well, we really had a successful campaign the first go around, you know, let's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <clears throat> uh, there were a few like kind of logistical things. Um, Cause the first one was a big experiment with all sorts of like reward tiers. We want to f- figure out what people are responding to. So we're going to streamline things a little bit this time. Um, but a lot of it too was just like, uh, again it was very validating our approach that we knew that communicating to people with very honest updates and sharing with them progress along the way and bringing them behind the scenes and making them feel like they're part of the creation of the book is the way to go and we're definitely planning on continuing that because that went so well last time um like it is the case that without our kickstarter backers in front of go red would not exist and we want to make sure that they feel that and we want to make sure that as the book is being created progressively, that they can see that development in real time and they can feel their contributions bring something to life slowly. Because that's one of the joys of making comics that you typically don't get to share is you put so much into it and it happens in what feels like slow motion. Uh, but as it does, you feel this thing building and building and building in it crosses from like that feels like something cool to like oh i can kind of see that to this is feeling good to like oh here it is it's finally starting to sh- take shape and you yeah being able to share that i think is a really powerful thing oh absolutely tom it's just a, a wonderful thing to be able to have a comic book out there and a whole franchise and everything you guys are doing that is super and massive and massive inversive that it is a, you know approachable and because you guys write as readers, as far as I'm concerned, mm-hmm. you know, you are that person, you're, you're writing to your readers. 
you you make it so okay well this is how i read ultimate spider-man in your particular case or you know whatever for any of the other writers and you see where you want the characters to go you see how you want to make it to get them in and, and get them hooked and trust me it yeah it works it's looking good <laughs> that's what we like to hear <laughs> <laughs> you know you put you put your shell yourselves in the reader's shoes and you don't write down to us that's, oh, that's yeah. what i'm saying you don't yeah. you know you you realize that we know this trope we know that trope we it's like okay they're doing this again they're doing that again oh wait we're kind of going there but with a twist yeah and i think that even writing um like i think already is a way book in a lot of ways but I think the reason that a lot of people who aren't in their teens are really responding to it is because I never write down to teenagers, you know, like mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. as smart as adults in basically every way and as emotively perceptible and engaged. Um, and I know that if I read the book and felt like it was shallow or lacking, then they would too. And that goes for every member of the audience. So yeah, you've got to have respect. And I think if you ever feel that slipping, then you know you need to step away from the project or rethink something pretty drastically because if you're not doing it with love, it's going to come through. And I've had that experience before, unfortunately, where you're writing something and you don't feel overwhelmingly proud of it and very enthusiastic about it. And that exists on the shelf in perpetuity for, you know, years and years and years and years, and you kind of have to live with that. And, you know, I don't want to have very much of that at all in my life. Yeah, that's what I said, but he said it better. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's true, though. I, I think that's one thing that's a testament to your writing, period. I mean, from everything that I've read that you've written. Thank you. You always make it very accessible to the audience, but I never feel like it's watered down or that I don't feel that I should be able to just pick it up instantly and go from there. Like, I think it's just, it's very much on a respectable level that you can pick up any story and really jump in. And especially with this one too, it has so many elements of what we love about superheroes mixed in with, you know, various influences that it truly stands on its own, but it's never one that I feel is just, you know, so you know, I, watered down, I guess, is probably the easiest way I can say it. I feel it's just on that level that it's smart, it's modern, it doesn't feel over the top, like there's, you know, some super complexity to it. But the message is what is the take home from this. I mean, it's always been from book one. It's not too, hey, I'm I'm a superhero. Hey, I'm watching Villain of the Week thing. It's not too teen drama that, oh my God, Billy broke up with me. <laughs> it's... It's a really nice balance of everything that's there. You have the, the parent-child relationship. You have the mystery. You have everything there. And it's it all plays well. Like, you know, mm -hmm. pineapple and pizza. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if <laughs> the, 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 I, I personally love pineapple and pizza. I don't know if that's a. Um, oh, my gosh. OK. I, the, I, to I, each I, their own. To each their own. I, I, I I'll, I'll qualify with this. With olives. I love the way that those two flavors sort of like balance each other out, but that's, that's either here or there. Mm -hmm. Sweet um, and salty and a little briny. Okay. I feel like. You, that no, the, like I said, to each their own. <laughs> <laughs> One of the keys uh, to getting that effect is not writing to genre and just writing at mm -hmm. people, right? Like. Absolutely. People, people's lives aren't any one way. Like we all deal with a range of emotions and we have, a range of different experiences and those things aren't disconnected from each other. Like it going back to that idea of like systems that influence each other, our romantic lives impact our work lives and, and our work lives in, in like interact with the way we interact with our families or our children. Writing that way means that you have a bunch of different types of stories and different feels, but it also is authentic to a person's life. And I think if you could build that out, it just feels like a real character. And that's going to like be a more fulfilling reading experience than one like shallow slice of like, this is just a crime procedural. That's just about the crime, you know? Mm -hmm. But it, it all plays together. Like I say, the pacing on it is, is one that it, it moves fast enough, but enough that you can have those moments where you really connect with the readers on this. And I think that that's where it really resonates with the fans of just the excitement for this. And now going into book two, I mean, when did the story 
start coming into your head after you got done with book one? Did you immediately start thinking book two and, and where Cassia's story was going? Or it was kind of like, let's wait and see how this goes and then revisit the world of Apex City? A little bit of both. When creating Inferno Go Red at the start, I had intended there to be more than book one, or at least hope there would be, right? Like I wrote book one with the idea that if it's successful, we could keep going and had a general idea of the shape of where things would be headed, uh, which allowed me to see book one with a bunch of things that might have felt very minor or throwaway, but will actually have grander implications as we continue on. Uh, and I guess it's a saying at the start, book two is very much about the consequences of book one starting to unfurl and having their own complications fold in. So the, it, it was definitely like in development in that sense. But I also did take a decent step away and a bit of a break after book one to just, it's less about like reader response because I never want to be just giving people what they want. But I definitely just needed a bit of a break and to work on some other sorts of stories to refresh and get my head straight and then came back and had some different perspective on some things coming back and, and tweak some things to change the direction. But it, it's always been one long project that hopefully we get to continue and keep unfurling a lot of the ideas that we started with. Now with the things, the little tidbits that you said, you know, we'll have the big grand payoffs down the road and with mm. the reader's feedback, do you feel like you possibly had painted yourself into a corner in some spots or do you think that you still have that wonderful artistic freedom to go where you need to yeah i never feel yeah, I limited feel by limited. plans i think that you could change plans you know and i think that but one of the benefits of planting so many seeds is that you have a lot of things that you can pick up on um and the, the, you know if the it's if, if the seed that you planted that is it going to grow into the big thing that you're hoping you could then do something else small with it to still pay it off, but take it a different direction. Uh, but I, I love, there's a, a freedom in planning. I think you can, uh, yeah, as I said, you put a lot of seeds into the ground and that gives you a lot of options. And what that means is when it comes time to write the next one, you're not there going, looking at a blank page, like, oh, now I have to come up with a new thing. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if anything, especially with this book, it's like, which of the things are we going to get to now? How are we going to get through all of it? in one book how can we squeeze in as much of it as possible without losing the character drama and the and the down moments that people seem to really respond to um but it's it's never a negative feeling for me i i like sort of long-term visions with the flexibility to pivot as you chase down those ideas and i think I, what i like to do is kind of have one core idea of a story or a belief but then follow that with the characters and follow the characters' experiences with that idea. And the, as the character goes, they may change their opinions or have new ideas about that thing as I do with them, which I think I take back to self-made. My first image book was, which was a book about how you deal with self-awareness and how you find purpose in a universe that doesn't clearly have a purpose for you. And that book, I went in with the idea that we would explore that, but not with any firm ideas about where it would end up. And I let the main character come into conflict with things and have those experiences and then make her own decisions. And that changed my own perspectives on, on those sort of like more philosophical questions. And that feels like a more authentic way to do it. It's sort of polemic. You're not coming in with a like, I'm going to tell people that this is the way it is you're exploring an idea with the audience and that's always going to feel more authentic and less like you're talking down to them, I think. Mm -hmm. And it definitely resonates that way too. I mean, that's the one thing, especially in this day and age where there's so many options for fans to go to that you really want to just come out with an authentic product. And that's one thing that every time anybody hears massive verse, they know it is because it's really such an inviting universe to come in and really get re-inspired to care about superheroes again. Cause I mean, other than like the big two, there's other superheroes sure around, but there's, but what you're doing there too, and especially the creative freedom, you can definitely see it in here is making that connection with the audience and really having that option to really take the story somewhere. And it's that level of excitement. That I think just wins everybody over. Yeah. And we, again, talking about being validated, very validated by our approach of like invite the fans in, 
make them feel like they are involved in the process in the sense of like supporting us and having a very direct connection with us, having things like the discord or um, different like creations that we create outside of the comics that they can go to. And it's never, we, we never want to make it feel like, Oh, we just do what the readers want and we'll like let them choose the path of the story. It's always our own stories to tell and our own expressions, but there's so much room within that to invite people in and make it feel, feel like a community. And that has worked out very well for us. And I'm glad it has because that's an approach I really believe in. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's so organic. And that's like the thing that I think everybody gravitates toward yeah. is it just really feels, and I always use this comparison, but I, I truly feel it is this reminds me as a comic reader when image was formed and everybody left Marvel yeah. and there was just such a buzz about it. And then you finally saw these creators who had made, magical stories with all these iconic characters they they're now doing their own thing and you see the fan response and i see that just those parallels with the massive verse and especially with inferno go red because you think about it is it's one volume as a kickstarter and still fans were buzzing about it so much that it carried over to a three-part series at the comic shops which still went over well and then to think now when that announcement got made at San Diego, it was just erupting and everybody's going, okay, when's this Kickstarter going live? I want to go get this. I mean, just to kind of have that buzz around this. I mean, it truly just it, talk about validation. I mean, that's that has to just be just the cherry on the Sunday, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. It, it definitely makes us feel like we're on the right track. And we definitely feel some kinship with the original image creators in the sense that like they created this freedom that we're now enjoying and exploiting and we know that we are very privileged to be able to use what they created and gifted us uh i personally think that it would be great if we could all have lamborghinis like they all have lamborghinis but yeah. we'll we'll <laughs> in, take in time yeah maybe <laughs> we'll see um, but we'll, we'll all be editors of uh, some some group one day. So. Yeah, totally. We'll settle for uh, the creative freedom for the moment. Well, you know what? You got to put that karma out there because that's how these dreams happen. And, you know, to think of going in this day and age to having such a successful creator-owned project that the fans are clamoring to go on Kickstarter and sign up for it. I mean, it's not out of the realm of thoughts. You know, put that positive energy out there. You never know what's going to happen. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, you, you got to think about that. <laughs> but with that being said, obviously, we know the Kickstarter is coming out. Mm. We've gotten a little bit of details. And obviously, I know things have to be kept under wraps because obviously we don't want to ruin anything. More. Well, I know. Yeah, we <laughs> Tell all, me more. We all want to know. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everybody that's watching this at home will definitely be, uh, you know, silent about it. But is there anything else that we can expect for Cassia after the Kickstarter? Should, like, should we expect to see her? appear in one of the other massive verse books or another crossover um yeah maybe you'll see cassia around i'm sure i think what i well we can say that the uh one of the other announcements at san diego was the massive verse fighting card game which we are very excited yes about, which will feature both cassia and the griffin as playable decks uh among the eight uh and that, that was a dream project for us that was actually came about uh well, it's a conflict of a few different things, but at San Diego last year, Michael and I, in the morning of the first day, were talking about different massive things and saying to each other, like, man, it would, it would be great to do a card game, but we'd want to do it right. Like, we don't want to do it in a way that feels like we're just slapping the brand on something. It would have to be an authentic representation of the story and the characters through the mechanics of the game. Uh, but we'd have to find the right partner and that's very difficult and we're not sure where we'd start. And then we got approached at the end of the Massive panel that day by uh, someone from Solus, the company that we're now working with, and they mm -hmm. wanted to pitch us on a card game. And we're like, listen, if, if you've got the right pitch, we are so primed for this. <laughs> uh, and we, we loved working with them and it turned out really cool. So uh, yeah, there'll be that. And there will probably be some more stuff in the future i would expect um and yeah i mean like you know there's still lots to come in book two as well lots of new uh potential things we've got 
you know, maybe a bit more romance than there was before, maybe some new villains, uh, mm. maybe some deeper looks into the mythology, uh, maybe yes. a better understanding of what Cassia is really facing, um, maybe a, a bit of a more of a look into the past, really just more of everything, more history, more drama, more consequences. And um, yeah, there's there's a lot to come. And we're definitely excited about that. The Kickstarter code is on the screen and you definitely want to make sure you're signing up for this book. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to be hearing about it from everybody else that they got their copy and you're sitting there left out. You really want to make sure that Inferno Go Red book two is in your collection as book one should be. You need that as a companion piece. I'm just saying it goes together. You know, like pineapples and olive. I, I'm sorry, I can't say that. I'll just say, I'll just say like cheese and pepperoni. But it, it definitely works. And I think before we let you go, Matt, there's a dying question that we all want to know here at the ODPH slash Nerd Initiative. What is the latest on New York Comic Con? Yes. Honestly. I still don't quite know. <laughs> I know it's really close, and that's on my mind as well. Um, it will depend on how big, few things go in the next couple of weeks, whether or not I can afford it. But it's still my my hope. Um, I have intentions of making it. Um, the rest of the Inferno Go Red team is going to be there. So if I'm not there, I'm going to be heartbroken. So, so I, are we. Yeah, I, I wish I could say right now, yes, yeah. absolutely. But... I can't say with absolute certainty, but looking more yes than no, I guess I would say at this point. Okay. Well, if it's based off sales for signing up on the Kickstarter, Marty, who is the unsung hero, like his daughter, have something else planned to kind of make sure that there's no way you leave watching this stream or you hear this on a podcast form without going to click on the link for the Kickstarter. So we're going to play that video for you right now. What's up, everybody? It's Marty coming to you from the Nerd Initiative bullpen. Not sure if you've seen or heard, but the amazing creative team of Matt Groom, Erica Durso, Igor Monte, and Becca Carey are coming out with a new Inferno Girl Red book. The first one was amazing, and if you haven't picked it up yet, you need to. We all here at the Nerd Initiative can't wait to see what unfolds with Cassia and her friends. The Kickstarter for book two should be live soon, so in celebration, we're going to be giving away two Ash Can variants right behind me here. You can only get these if you bought the hardcover edition that was a part of the Kickstarter. This thing is incredible. It's a 10 page mini comic and it's one of my favorite variants the IGR team has produced. So how to enter, follow the Nerd Initiative and the new Kickstarter page, link's gonna be below, and send me a DM with picture proof. Entries are gonna be open until 10 p.m. Eastern on August 31st and entries will be compiled and randomly selected after that. Also, let us know how you like the first book and what you're looking forward to most in the next one in the comments below. Good luck everybody. Thank you guys, and I absolutely encourage everyone to get in on that because those are those ash cans are hum, hard to come by, so it's a pretty cool prize. Yes, I, I say when we this book got announced, I think that was the first thing that went around, and Marty was leading the charge about that because obviously he is as passionate as we are about this. But you know, he was the first time he's like, we got to make sure this book is a hit. We really got to make sure that everybody has this in their hands because we all talk about this behind the scenes. And for this book coming out, like the reaction we have, and you can hear the sound of my voice, this is not one that you want to miss. You want to go sign up on the Kickstarter immediately, let alone you get entered in the Nerd Initiative drawing for the two ash cans. Like free comics on top of buying one of the best books of 2023. Seriously, folks, we can't make it any easier for you. I mean, like I say, it, it's one of the best deals on the market because all you got to do is just click on that QR code and sign up. And then go right there and sign up and get your copy of Inferno Girl Red Book 2. It's that simple, folks. So what are you waiting for? Make sure you click on that. But before that, we have to say, Matt, final words on Inferno Girl Red Book 2 and what we should be expecting. And just give us that final push over the top. What Cassia is going to go through and how Erica brings it to life I think he's really going to shock and surprise even people who are like very ardent into Inferno Go Red. Um, it's we're, we're taking everything that hopefully people loved about the first book and blowing it up in every direction. New villains, bigger moments, more drama, and more dire consequences for everybody involved. 
And if you haven't been following Inferno Girl Red thus far with the Kickstarter, we are going to have ways for you to read Inferno Girl Red book one as well. So you can jump on right now. You don't need to feel like you've missed the train. Everyone is welcome. Everyone can join in. And we hope you do. Absolutely. Tom? Funny anecdote here. Now, Matt knows this, and I'm going to put it out here on the internet just for everybody to know. Uh, last year when you guys sent us the uh, the previews, I like we talked about pacing and everything's fantastic. I didn't realize because there was no stops in between volume one or volume one to two and two to three. I read all three volumes in one shot. Yeah. So I show up here to the studio to talk to Ken to talk to you about, you know, the first, you know, book one. And I'm like, yeah, man, that's freaking awesome. I'm oh, in. This is cool. You can only can go this far. What? Yeah, you just saw the the air let out of the balloon, and Tom's like, "Wait, wait, hold on, what?" I'm like, "No, we can only talk about book one." And he's he just just the sheer look of terror in his face, going, "Oh my god!" But I want to talk about it so much more. I do <laughs> because the book is that good. It is. I think everybody that has read Inferno Girl Red has like just absolutely just binge read it because it's that good. You want action, you got it. You want drama, you got it. You want the superhero thematics that we all know and love as comic readers. It's there. But it still drives home the message of hope, which in this day and age is so hard to find. But yet you open up this book, you get the escapism, but you put it down reading and just having that much feeling as you head out to your day and head back to the comic shop to go, where's the next issue? I need this. Absolutely. Yeah. Matt? Thank you again for coming on the show. You know you're welcome back anytime. In fact, after the Kickstarter is in our hands, I think you have to come back on and we have to kind of do a deep dive read through. I'd love that. I love hanging out with you guys every time. So I'll be back anytime you'll have me. Oh, absolutely. Just got to shoot that DM and we'll make that happen. For Tom, why don't you let everybody know where we can find you? Well, luckily you can find me down here in the links. I've got all my links going on right there. There I am off the cuff, Tom, the pop culture connoisseur coming right at you live and direct. Check out all the stuff I've got going on, the podcast, the this, the that, the other thing, the reviews, everything here with the Nerd Initiative. I'm just a busy guy, busy, busy, busy guy, and I will hopefully see you on the interwebs. Absolutely. So like we say, we got the QR codes for Matt throughout this channel. We got the QR codes for Tom out on, on this channel. And if you want to talk to me and the rest of the ODPH team, simple, you can swing on over to odphpodcast.com or click on that handy dandy handy QR code at the bottom of the screen and make sure that you're following everything going on with nerd and your home for pop culture positivity. Another antidote. I know Tom is keeping track of these because I'm trying to come up with something different each and every time, but my name is Ken M. And as we like to say each and every time we turn a page, if you're at the comic shop and you got a great issue in your hands and you see somebody else is puzzled and needs to get something in their collection that you know is a definite hit, hand it off to them and tell them turn a page. We'll see you next time.